Please stand in body or in spirit to join in the responsive call to worship. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit. To each of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Eternal God, our Redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you. We have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and turn from our neighbors. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry and the poor. O oh God, in your great mercy, forgive our sin and free us from selfishness. Lead us to faith by the works of your Son that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. grace of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And uh, uh, Joyce and Beth were about to, uh, to uh, just uh, take the initiative, as they probably should have, uh, but uh, because I told them that uh, Joel was not here. But uh, I told Joel when I spoke with him earlier today that I would go ahead and try to do a children's message. Even though as I'm looking out there, I don't think we officially have any children out in the congregation, though we might have some on Zoom. And uh, uh, so uh, let me say that uh, in connection with the, uh, the lesson, that uh, we'll have as our scripture lection for this morning, uh, which will be uh, uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, a story that we usually know as uh, the miracle of uh, uh, the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. And uh, uh, so uh, Joel and I were talking about it a little bit earlier, and uh, Joel points out that uh, one way that you can talk about water becoming wine, whether you believe in miracles or not, is simply the way that... Uh, the rain is filtered through the ground around vineyards, and that water is absorbed by, the, by God's nature and becomes the fruit of the vine. Um, and uh, that in itself will eventually become wine uh, with fermentation. So uh, yes, in a certain way, by nature, uh, water becomes wine. Now, uh, it is true that uh, Jesus works this miracle by sidestepping the vineyard. Uh, but uh, it is just interesting that there are, it, it's a matter of perspective, I think, is what the point Joel was making and the way he probably would offer it if, uh, if he were here today to tell you about this, that uh, uh, 
that the miracle can happen even in stages, uh, that God basically works miracles every single day in the simple beauty of creation that we usually take for granted. Uh, Joel also wanted me to mention uh, that uh, uh, what, I, what to, he wanted me to show to the children what a gallon jug looked like, and unfortunately I didn't think to, to get one before coming up here. But I think most everyone has seen a gallon jug. You've seen a gallon of milk, or you've seen uh, you, uh, large containers of, uh, of a gallon of orange juice or something to that effect. Now, uh, in the story, you're going to see that Jesus turns si uh, uh, six jars of water into wine. Each jar is approximately 20 or 30 gallons. So we're talking about 100, uh, as much as 180 gallons of wine uh, for a wedding. Um, 180 gallons. Now, if you know what a gallon jug looks like, can you imagine 180 of those? And this is, uh, as Joel was telling me, how we can communicate to our young people, to our children, about how magnanimous God's love is for us, because that's the miracle, that God loves us. And he loves us abundantly, not only in quantity, but in quality. Uh, so I share that as uh, a, a form of a children's message. I share that understanding that uh, Joel is a far better storyteller than I am. Uh, so I, uh, I share that with you to uh, set the stage for our scripture lection, which we will uh, be focusing on uh, following our anthem. Thank you very much.
As God is glorified by the anthem, may God also be glorified by our proclamation. Let us pray. Gracious God, again we come before you on this most challenging day, yet the Lord's Day, a day that you have made for us. We pray that you will recreate us anew every day by the proclamation of your word. Proclaim yourself to us. Become your own interpreter beyond the sacred page. Leap beyond the page by your spirit into our hearts, into our minds. Abide within our souls that we might have living within us the incarnation of your word, Jesus Christ. And empowered by the words you speak to us this day, may we have the love of Christ so much abiding in us that it is available for us to share with the world. Remind us that Christ is not just a gift that you give to us. It is a gift you require of us to share with everyone whom we encounter. Speak to us this sacred word this day. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. As you heard me say <coughs> a little earlier in the service, that uh, this passage is traditionally referred to as the wedding at Cana, or sometimes the miracle at Cana, uh, because according to John, uh, this is the very first miracle or sign that Jesus works in the course of his public ministry. And that may be debated depending on which gospel you read, but according to John, this is his first miracle, his first sign. John is a gospel of signs, if you will, uh, whereas it works almost the exact opposite as you find in Mark. Remember when we read in Mark's gospel, there's this messianic secret motif that runs through the pages where, where Jesus' identity remains a secret to his disciples and to the rest of the world. But here in John, Jesus is doing everything he can uh, showing the world miracles and signs, trying to show a, uh, uh, a thick-headed uh, world who he is so that they might finally understand that he is the presence of God's love abiding with them. This is the first miracle, uh, according to John, to reveal that. Uh, you'll see here that Jesus and the disciples have been invited to a wedding. We don't know anything else about the circumstances of this wedding. I will tell you that, uh, that weddings, especially among uh, uh, the more um, aristocratic members of uh, Jewish society could go on for days, even a week, the, the wedding celebration. It's, uh, it's hard for me to imagine, but uh, it might warrant the need for such copious amounts of wine um, that uh, will be featured in this particular story. Not only are Jesus and the disciples guests at this wedding, but so is Jesus' mother. And I want to mention this just as an interesting side note. It doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but I just think it's an interesting tidbit. And that is that uh, Jesus' mother is mentioned all throughout John's Gospel. She's mentioned in this particular story. What's interesting, though, is that where we know her name to be Mary from Matthew's Gospel, Mark's, and Luke's Gospel, John's Gospel never uh, names her. Uh, she is a featured character in so many of the stories in John's Gospel, but she's never named. It's just an interesting thing. All throughout John's Gospel, the mother of Jesus is referred to as the mother of Jesus, and you'll see that illustrated here this day. With that as the introduction, my Christian friends, I invite you, listen for the word of God. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. 
and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. An amazing story, my Christian friends, one of extravagance, and one that sometimes is difficult for us to relate to on two fronts. One, it's hard for me to imagine a, uh, a wedding celebration going on for a week, uh, uh, and one such that it would require at least 180 gallons of wine. Uh, of course, then more so, because uh, the wine apparently gave out to start with. Uh, the second thing is uh, that I find difficult to, uh, to relate to is that uh, let's face it, my Christian friends, you and I live in a, a scientific age. We, are, uh, an, we live in an age of reason. Uh, we live in a modern world where we have a different mindset than perhaps the, the ancients did. It's hard for us to think in terms of miracles. We're, uh, we are not geared to immediately default to the idea of a miracle in our average everyday world. If something seemingly miraculous happens, our first thought is there must be some rational explanation, some, some reasonableness behind what appears to be a miracle in order to account for it, simply because that's where we are in our world. We tend to think everything has some reasonable explanation because we believe that the world is rationally intelligible. That, there is, uh, that the world uh, can answer to control, it answers to order. Uh, that's just how we think in our modern day world. Uh, which puts us at odds with this story. The central act in the story of the wedding at Cana is the miraculous transformation of water to wine. Living in a rational scientific age, we find miracles puzzling confusing, enigmatic, maybe even unbelievable. We are often tempted to talk around the miracles, to explain them away, to make sense of them in some way that our, our 21st century minds can, can grasp them. We might focus on the, dif on the, the differences between the, uh, the biblical worldview and the 21st century worldview. Maybe that's a way that we would approach this story to, to, uh, to account for the miracle, to, to put it in some context that our scientific and rational minds can understand. And I'm here to tell you, my Christian friends, that uh, first and foremost, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter whether you believe in miracles or not. And I'm going to say that as a pastor who often reads passages of miracles being performed in Scripture. It really doesn't matter when you read this story whether you believe in miracles or not. If you don't believe in miracles, that's fine. If you do believe in them, that's fine. I'm here to tell you that whether you believe in miracles or not does not change why this story is in Scripture and what John what God is trying to tell us in telling them the story. Yes, we classify this as a miracle story, but I always want people to realize the reason miracle stories are in Scripture is not because of the miracle. The miracle stories are never about the miracle. The miracle is simply the delivery device or the, uh, the delivery system for getting the point to you. There is a lesson to be learned in the miracle story. The story, believe it or not, is not about the miracle. The miracle is just the way that the story is conveyed. 
The essence of any miracle is that it shatters conventional expectations. It shatters explanation. That's the whole point. That's why we call them miracles. You can't explain them. And, and again, that's the point. And this is the reason it's so hard for modern uh, 21st century minds to actually begin to engage in this story because in some ways we waste our time debating the facticity of miracles. And we don't listen to the story. We should not try to diminish the extraordinariness of the story in any way. Just let the miracle story be what it is. No one is telling you you have to stop believing in your, your scientific worldview. No one is telling you to believe in miracles if you don't already. If you believe in them, again, fine. If not, fine. We must faithfully struggle with the miracle story and what the story is telling us about Jesus Christ because that's what the story is about. It's not about the miracle. It's about Jesus Christ. The contrast between the responses of, of the steward, the chief steward in the story, and that of the disciples can help us as contemporary Christians interpret and appropriate the text because, strangely enough, the steward in the story does exactly what you and I are tempted to do with any miracle story, and that is to find some rational explanation for what has just happened. That's what the steward does. Take a look. The steward is perplexed by the sudden appearance of wine of such quality and quantity. This is good wine, and there's lots of it. And he's confused. He doesn't understand where this came from. He assumes the wine can be explained by some conventional reasoning. He attributes the wine to the unprecedented hospitality of the bridegroom. He assumes that the bridegroom is exercising um, a, a, an incredible level of grace, of magnanimity, of generosity, in bringing out just copious amounts of wine here late into the celebration. The miracle story here, for the, from the steward's perspective, is that it's not a miracle at all. It's just um, a, a, an irregularity in wedding etiquette. That's how he's, he's describing it. That's what he thinks is happening. It's just an irregularity in the way weddings are usually run. But, uh, but no, no, nothing miraculous to see here. It's just an act of special generosity, special kindness on the part of the bridegroom who sponsors the wedding. But the miracle cannot be explained that way. The steward tries to reshape the miracle to fit the former categories that he lives in, as we all do. We try to, we try to, we, we see something happening, we, we try to interpret it in, in uh, categories that we understand. We try to make sense of it, just as the steward is. But the disciples, Jesus' disciples here, they're willing to allow their categories of the world to be transformed, just like the water is being transformed into wine. They're wanting, they are willing to see a new paradigm, if you will, in reality. Something new is happening in the universe. Something new is happening in the world. That's what the disciples are opening themselves to see. They see the miraculous abundance of good wine as a sign of God's miraculous presence among them in the person of Jesus Christ. They see the miracle story as a symbol of an even greater miracle. God with us, in the flesh, abiding with us, walking with us, living with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And they recognize Jesus as the one who is bringing this miraculous presence of God into the world. The miracle of the wine shatters the boundaries of the conventional world. And likewise, God's inbreaking into the world, as John is describing it here in this gospel, it shatters the boundaries of, of the disciples' world. Christ is the inbreaking of God. The real miracle here is God coming into the world. My Christian friends, the love of God abiding with us. That's the miracle. In this, in this miracle story. 
and the disciples know it. Why? Because the very last statement here, John chapter 2, verse 11, the disciples believed in him. Whether they believe in the miracle of the water to wine is irrelevant. Whether you believe it is irrelevant. What is essential is for us to believe as the disciples believe. The disciples believed in him as the presence of God's love, the miraculous presence of God's love in a world where we could just otherwise use our conventional vision and see the world as just mundane, loveless, and basically marching forward without any hope of redemption, any hope of love, any hope of care and compassion for one another. John chapter 2 here in, these miracle, in this miracle story, verses 1 through 11, poses some hard questions for us, my Christian friends. The, the, the miracle challenges conventional assumptions about order, about control, about the nature of the world around us. It, it challenges our conventional assumptions about what is possible. Now again, maybe you'd find it questionable whether it's possible to turn water to wine. But the story is asking you to ask an even greater question, to consider a possible change in the conventions that, that maybe God can be found around us. Maybe God is not this transcendent being who exists beyond the chasm of, of knowledge and hope. Maybe God really has stepped into our universe. Maybe God has punched a hole into human history and has decided to dwell among us. Maybe there are some new possibilities for us to consider, my Christian friends. Here's the question, where is God now found? Out there beyond us, or right here with us? How is God known? Is God completely unknowable, or can we look to someone in the flesh to show us who God is, to show us the love of God? Jesus Christ. The force of the miracle story here derived, is, is, is derived precisely because of its extraordinariness. If we cannot entertain the possibility of extraordinariness when we face this miracle story, then the wonder of God's extraordinariness and his love for us, maybe that's also beyond us. Again, I don't care whether you believe whether uh, water is turned to wine. What I do care about is do you believe as the disciples believe? Can you believe that miracle? Can you believe in the miracle that God loves us? That God really cares about us so much so he's willing to take on our suffering, to take on our human plight, to join with us in our laughter and tears, in our joy and our sorrow. That God loves us so much that he would actually get his hands dirty by living like one of us. To me, that's the miracle, my Christian friends. And for some reason, I don't have a hard time believing in that miracle. There are times when I ask the question, why in the world does God go through all the trouble of loving us? You know, when I was younger, I, I, and I, I'll be honest with you, when I use my rational mind, when I, when, I, when I think cognitively about this, it's very, very difficult for me to understand why God loves us. But by the very same token, I have a hard time understanding why we love anyone. But we do, don't we? Can we believe that miracle that God loves us? Can we believe the miracle that it's possible for us to love the unlovable? for us to reach out in concern for others just as God has done for us. When I use my rational mind, no, I can't understand that. But there is something inside me that tells me I can feel it. I know God loves. I know he loves me. I know he loves you. I know God so loves the world. And Christ becomes that perfect embodiment of that love for me to know a God who otherwise would simply be abiding in a chasm beyond us. My Christian friends, I, in, I invite you, whatever you think of miracles, believe like the disciples believed. 
Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in God's love. Believe that that miracle can come true. I don't care about the parlor tricks of turning water into wine. I really don't. What I do care about is the love of God which the disciples can begin to see in Christ's glory when this event happens. Because if water can be turned to wine, then can't we certainly believe that God loves this sinful and broken world? Can we embrace that miracle, my Christian friends? Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. Having heard how God calls us to faith by his word, let us now reaffirm our Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to stand as we reaffirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, once again, we approach you with the assurance of faith that comes in your abiding word within us. We give you thanks that even in these times of rational thinking, of scientific age, of living in a world that has to be quantified, cataloged, and controlled, that there are still some things, some inexplicable aspects that change our lives. May your love for us and for this sinful and broken world be such a miracle. May we be transformed by your spirit abiding in us, making that love a reality. And may your love made known in your son, Jesus Christ, be at work in us as we continue to make your love known to all whom we encounter. May the world know that miracle, and may they accept it so well, so openly, so unquestionably, that we never again question the miraculousness of your presence among us. This we pray in Christ's most holy name, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, I want to remind everyone, though we do not pass the offering plates right now in this time of pandemic, and that's something else, by the way, as a side note to keep up in our prayers, uh, the latest numbers for Madison County put us at 25.11% positivity rate, the highest I've seen yet, and uh, uh, I am convinced we will get through this, but uh, but keep hanging in, through, hanging in there. We're uh, uh, we're doing fine. We're finding ways to deal with it. In fact, our, I should mention also for a prayer concern, our, our Presbytery executive for the Presbytery of Transylvania, um, fully vaccinated and, um, and has his boosters. He's been diagnosed with, uh, with COVID. He does have symptoms, um, and he says it's uh, uh, quite uncomfortable, but, uh, but he's confident he's going to do fine. I'm confident he's going to do fine. Keep, keep him in your prayers. I mention all of this. Uh, uh, as we are striving diligently to, uh, to love each other within six-foot increments, 
Uh, and uh, so that's why we don't pass the offering plates. That said, it's always appropriate for us whenever we gather to worship uh, to, uh, to offer of ourselves to God and to each other. And one of the ways we usually do that is through our tithes and offerings. Uh, so uh, you'll have that opportunity with the offering plate uh, in the narthex, or you can uh, mail in your offering, or you can go online and uh, give that way. Uh, but so that you can meditate on the giving of yourself to God and to one another as part of our worship, uh, we are blessed to have a time of offertory for just such a meditation. Let us meditate during this time. <laughs>
especially that vocal.